This evening, uh, there, there are actually many passages of Scripture that we could go to to look at this particular doctrine. As a matter of fact, uh, I think I had mentioned before, I think it might have even been this morning, that there was a time, of course, when, when I didn't understand it, didn't believe it, fought against it, and so forth. I didn't believe the Bible taught it. I did realize there were a couple of passages in Scripture that I, I couldn't make any sense out of that seemed to be teaching this doctrine, couldn't get, seemed to get around it, so I would just kind of skip over those and go to others. But when I finally did understand it, then I realized it was really shot throughout Scripture. You can hardly read any passage of Scripture without seeing God's sovereignty, even in this area of salvation. So as I've said, there are many places we could go, but I thought we would go to one of the clearest passages in Scripture to begin. We'll look at a couple of others along the way, but let's begin with Ephesians chapter 1. What I want us to look at are in verses 3 through 6, but I'd like to read a little bit more of the context uh, just so we can see some of the other things that are here as well that, that add to it. And forgive me if this isn't the text that I chose before, but I, I'd like to read verses 1 through 14. Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things, after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of of his glory. I do want you to notice in this particular text who it is that Paul is addressing. This letter, sometimes Christians, believers think that these letters are addressed to the world. They're not addressed to the world. They're addressed to particular churches, in this case to the church at Ephesus. And notice in verse 13, those who having listened to the message of truth, the gospel, who believed, who were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's not addressed to the world just generally, but these things are, are addressed to Christians, to true believers who have, uh, you know, have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ so that what he has just written applies to them. It doesn't apply to the world in case you want to understand this passage as saying that God chose the world. God chose everyone. Uh, that's not what he's saying here. Obviously, in Scripture, there are those who will perish, those who will end up in hell because they haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, because of their sins. So this isn't addressed to the world. This is addressed to those who have believed, and we need to understand the reason why they believe is because of God's choice. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, again, we're going to uh, look at that a little bit more, but just by way of quick review, as we're going through this series, we have seen at least three other things. Uh, we did... And again, understanding the, the um, reason why we're doing what we're doing is 
uh, to seek to explain why it is that we hold to be true certain things. Certain things as opposed to those who don't believe, those who are unbelievers, uh, things that we believe as opposed to other churches that historically have actually rejected the gospel, why we believe the gospel and what that is, uh, why we believe certain things that are different from other churches that, that are true believers, but again, uh, do not see things exactly the way that we do. Now, this, this is one that falls into that latter category. We have seen that God exists as opposed to agnostics and atheists. We have seen that the Bible is his word as opposed perhaps to the liberals who believe that it contains his word or it becomes his word as you read it. We believe all of it is his word, every single word of it, uh, that inspiration, the fact that it's God-breathed applies to all. We've also seen that God is triune, that he is a trinity as opposed to those, we wouldn't call them churches necessarily, that believe that there's only one person in the Godhead. We call them uh, Unitarians. Uh, but this evening we're going to see something that sets us apart from other evangelical Christians in the fact that we believe that God is absolutely sovereign in all things, including those who will ultimately be saved. Now, most Christians, I believe, don't have trouble with the doctrine of God's sovereignty in general. I mean, they do believe that he controls things, at least certain things. He's in control of world events. He's in control of the weather. He's in control of natural catastrophes, so-called. Uh, there are, by the way, evangelical Christians who don't believe that, that God is in control of those things. But certainly, most Christians believe he is and that he is control in control of at least most of the things that go on in our lives. But there are believers, and perhaps a majority of evangelical believers do not believe that God is in ultimate control of those who will be saved and those who will not be saved. As a matter of fact, church history... Is, is full of uh, various ways to kind of get around this doctrine to try to explain just how much responsibility lies on you versus how much lies on God for your ultimate salvation. Uh, very early on, there was a, a person by the name of Pelagius who was a monk who lived in the fourth century who believed that it really had all to do with us. Salvation was entirely a work that we do uh, Adam gave us a bad example. Uh, Jesus gave us a good example. And if we follow Jesus' good example, then eventually we'll make it to heaven. Actually, history has borne out that those who believe such things can't be true believers because it makes our salvation depend entirely on works. And Paul tells us quite plainly, as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now, certainly if those who seek to keep God's perfect righteous standard are under the curse for trying to keep that and trying to save themselves by it, how much more those who try to save themselves through some standard that is less holy than God's law. No, the Bible plainly tells us that no one is saved by works. If we try to save ourselves by our own works, which in God's eyes are like filthy rags, we will perish. But most Christians believe, then, that man can't do it on, their, on his own, that they need God's help, and that God has provided that help. God has made salvation available through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That basically, what Jesus has done, he has done for everyone. God has done his part. He has provided salvation. Now man has to do his part. Man has to believe. Now, we don't doubt that man has to believe. The question is, how does he come to believe in the state that he is in? Well, these Christians believe that man has the ability, as he comes into the world by nature, that everyone can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ if they choose to do so. In other words, God provides salvation. He says, here's Jesus Christ, and he wants you to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and I agree with that. But then man has to do his part. Man has to... Uh, receive the Lord Jesus Christ under his own power. And we're going to see this evening that that really isn't a possibility because man does not have that power. Man does not have that ability because of sin. So we would differ with that. 
Now, we're going to see this evening that both of those positions, it's all man or it's part God and part man, both of those positions are wrong. And salvation, according to the scriptures, is from first to last the work of the Lord. Now, again, we're going to see how all that works together, but we're going to look at this under four points. For those of you who have the uh, handouts, you'll see that the, the four points on your outline. First of all, we believe in election because the Bible teaches it. Secondly, we believe in election because it's impossible that we could ever have chosen God without his first having chosen us or giving us the, the, the help, I mean, absolute help that we need in order to trust him. And then we're, th those are the two, uh, you might say, the two doctrinal points. And then we're going to third and the fourth points are going to deal with, so what? Why is it important that we believe this? Well, these two points are this, that if it weren't for election, if God had not chosen anyone, all of us would have perished. And then fourthly, because election is true, we owe God all the glory for our salvation. We don't pat ourselves on the back. We don't boast, but we give all the praise to him. So first of all, we believe in election because the Bible teaches it, and that's the reason why I wanted to start with this particular text, because let's consider what we see in this passage. It begins with Paul blessing God for all the blessings that he has given to us in the heavenly places in the Lord Jesus Christ. Once a person trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ and is in Christ, then everything that Jesus Christ has done for sinners becomes that person's through his work. Without Jesus Christ, we would have none of these things. And that's something at least that a majority of believers believe. I should say all believers must believe that. But Paul notes that these blessings didn't begin with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. These blessings did not begin with our faith, but they began before God created the world. They began in eternity. Notice Paul says, before the foundation of the world, the Father chose us in Christ that we would be holy and blameless before him. Now, we can only be holy and blameless in the Lord Jesus Christ. If God chose us to be holy and blameless, he must have chosen us to be in Christ because there is no other way. Notice Paul also says, before the foundation of the world, he predestined us. He predetermined this is the direction we would go. This is what he would give us. He predestined us to adoption, that we would become the sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. Paul actually tells us in Romans 8, verse 29, that what he predestined us to was that we would be conformed to the image of his son, that we would become like Jesus Christ. And in doing so, he would adopt us as his children. I mean, everyone who is like Jesus Christ is a child of God. But you can only become like Jesus Christ by trusting in him. So if we are predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ, if we are predestined to be adopted into his family, we must be predestined to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice in this passage who it is that is actually doing the choosing. Let's ask the question, is it man who is making the choices here or is it God? Well, clearly in this passage, it is God. Okay? He's the one who has blessed us with every blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He is the one who has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. He is the one who has predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters. Now, if this was the only passage we had in Scripture, it would be enough to prove election because in every instance, God is the one making the choice. And I want you to notice it says nothing about what man does or what man chooses. It has everything to do with God. Now, I mentioned before that there are many other passages in Scripture that point this out. And let me just read for you a couple of quotes from Romans chapter 9. Perhaps you'd like to turn that up and follow along. Romans chapter 9 was one of those chapters in the Scripture where when I did not believe in God's sovereignty and salvation, I could not understand 
too many passages that are just too pointed. Let's just read a couple of sections of Romans chapter 9. First of all, verses 10 through 13. Paul writes this after talking about the fact that uh, God's promises to Israel haven't failed. God never actually promised to save all of Israel, but God did promise to save those who were chosen. And so he's going on through this argument. He reaches verse 10. He says, and not only this, but there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now again, this points out that God made a choice before they were born, before they had done anything, so that it couldn't be something that was determined by their works, by what they did. God made a choice even before they were born to set his affection on one, but not on the other. And history bears out that God did deal with Jacob and brought from Jacob ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ. But Esau grew further and further away from the Lord until his posterity was actually destroyed. And then in verses 14 through 16, just following on this text, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Now, in the context of Romans chapter 9, it is speaking about salvation. What does it all ultimately boil down to? It boils down to the one who will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And again, look at verses 20 and 21, talking about the potter's right to do with his clay whatever he wills. He can make a vessel for honorable use. He can make a vessel for dishonorable use. He says this, the thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? The fact is God has absolute right over his creatures to do what he wills. Now, the pride of man does not like that doctrine. We don't like to think that, that we are not the ultimate center of all things. Uh, many Christians believe God created man because he needed fellowship or he wanted fellowship and he wanted to bless man and he wanted to do all these things with man and man is the center. But man isn't the center of God's work or his plan. God's glory is at the center of his plan and his desire to reveal all that glory and this is simply a part of it, his sovereignty his mercy and his grace, even his justice are all things that God desired to reveal through his work of salvation. So with regard to who is saved and who isn't saved, who it is that's, that God is going to bring near to himself and who not, it ultimately depends upon God. He makes the choice. And he made that choice according to our text before the foundation of the world and that predestination to become conformed to the image of his son. All these things were done before he made the world, before he made us, before we were born, before we had done anything good or bad. It ultimately had to do with God's choice. Now, some do say, what does God base his choice on? And they believe that it ultimately is man's faith that he bases this choice on. And again, you've probably heard this. God looks forward in time, and he sees who it is that's going to receive him as the gospel is offered to them, and those who receive him, then he chooses them. I mean, doesn't God look ahead to see who it is that's going to become holy in the Lord Jesus Christ and then bring them into the family? Again, I want you to notice our text does not say that. It actually says something quite different. It doesn't say that his choice is based upon a choice that we make, it doesn't say that he chose us because we would become holy in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
but it says that he chose us in order that we might be holy and blameless in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, which means he chose to give us the grace to trust in Jesus. It doesn't say that he predestined us to adoption because we would be like his son, but rather he predestined us that we might become like his son. There's a big difference between those two things. I want you to notice as well that Paul does tell us something as to why God did what he did, why he chose some, why he predestined some. And Paul does tell us it has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with God. I want you to notice in verse 4 at the very end, which gives us sort of the beginning of verse 5, in love... He predestined us to adoption as sons. So what was the motive? Well, it was love. What what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean us. It means God. There was this love within God that moved him to do this. He predestined us to adoption, Paul goes on to say, according to the kind intention of his will. Again, that's in God. It's not in us. And to the praise of of the glory of his grace. That again has to do with God and not with us. Notice, nothing is said of any choice on our part that moved God to make his choice of us. It's all about what God was pleased to do for his own glory and out of his love and his mercy. Now again, as I said before, there are those who would still want to say God makes this choice based upon what God perceives we're going to do. And the reason why they do that is because of a couple of different passages in Scripture. Let me read them to you. Romans 8.29 and 1 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. 1 Romans 8.29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. God foreknew them. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. I want you to notice that in those two texts, we have the word God foreknew. And also it says that, uh, well, Peter is writing to those who were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, what they say again is that God made his choice based upon what he foreknew or foresaw they were going to do or what we were going to do. He saw us exercising faith and he chose us because we were exercising faith. Now, let's assume for a moment that they're right, and that's exactly what God did. That would mean two things, at least. First of all, God is not the one doing the choosing, really. Man is. The only thing that God would be choosing to do in a case like that would be choosing those who chose him. And that's really not a choice, at least in the sense that we see the scriptures talking about God choosing us. It's rather man ultimately making the choice. It takes the sovereignty away from God. But here's the second objection, and perhaps even a larger one. If man is going to choose or make the ultimate choice, then he must have the ability to do that. I mean, for God to choose those who choose him, there has to be at least some people who have the ability to do this. But the Bible says we don't have that Ability. Now that brings us to the second point. We have to believe in election because according to scripture, it's impossible that we could have chosen the Lord Jesus Christ without God's help, without his intervening. Because what does the Bible actually say about our condition as we come into the world? Well, let's consider a few things. First of all, David writes in Psalm 51 verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. In the context, David is lamenting the fact that he 
committed adultery with Bathsheba, and he had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, put to death. He's a murderer and an adulterer. And as he's contemplating his sin, he, he goes back to the very origin. He says, this is the way I was conceived. This is the way I was born. This is the way I came into the world. David wasn't talking just about himself, but this is the way we all come into the world. Paul tells us in Romans 3, verses 10 through 12, that we of ourselves cannot do anything good. That apart from God's grace, we cannot even seek after the Lord, at least in a way that, that, that makes any difference. He says this, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Now, I, I would suggest to you that if you could, in and of your own strength, even receive the Lord Jesus Christ, that would be a good thing. But there is none who seeks for God. There is none who does good. Let's go a little bit further. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, that, if, that when we did not have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, and by the way, he's very clear in Romans chapter 8, only believers have the Spirit of God living in them, dwelling in them. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you are in the flesh. That is the way we come into the world, in the flesh. Well, what is true of those who are in the flesh? Romans 8, verses 7 and 8. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, ultimately, what is the end result of this? I mean, the fact that we're conceived and born in sin, the fact that uh, having this disposition, we don't seek after God, we don't do anything good, we're hostile toward God, we will not submit to God, we will not submit to his law, we can't please him. Okay, this is our, this is our condition. Well, Jesus sums it up in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, where he writes this. This is the judgment that light has come into the world, and he's referring to himself and, and his teaching in the gospel. This is the judgment that light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Now, again, I would submit to you that that is the condition of every single human being that comes into the world according to David, according to what Paul writes, according to what Jesus himself says. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Now, if this was our condition, uh, apart from the grace of God as we come into the world, how could we have ever savingly come to the light and receive the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the Bible says we couldn't that God has to intervene before we can actually come. And that's exactly what he did if we are believers here this evening. When we were dead in our sins, he made us alive. That's what Paul tells us in Ephesians. Again, the book we're looking at here, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and then verses 4 through 5. He starts off by saying, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And by the way, you weren't physically dead, but spiritually dead. That's the condition that we just were describing, what it means to be spiritually dead, which means you hate God. You can't submit to his law. You won't come to the light. That was our condition. But in verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved. I want you to notice he says nothing in there about any action or choice on the part of man. You were dead, but God, but God intervened. Now, Jesus calls this intervention by God the new birth. He calls it being born again. And I would remind you of what he says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3, and then verses 5 through 6. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. To be spiritually dead is to be of the flesh, as we've already seen. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. To be born again of the Spirit is to be made alive. And that's what Paul means when he says, but God, being rich in mercy, when we were dead, made us alive. Unless we are born again by the Spirit of God, we can't see the kingdom of heaven, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, and who is it that the Spirit causes to be born again? And Jesus goes on to tell Nicodemus that the wind blows where it wilts. You hear the sound of it, but you don't see where it's coming from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, it's, the Spirit is like the wind. You, you, you don't see it. It's invisible. You can't see Him, that is. But He blows where He wills. He grants life where He wills under the preaching of the gospel. You can't see it happening, but you can see the effects. It changes a person's life. Without this intervention on God's part, we would have done absolutely nothing. We wouldn't have been able to do anything to move ourselves toward God. I mean, listen to what Jesus says in John 6, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. By the way, the people that Jesus was speaking to, the vast majority of them left. They didn't follow anymore. And then Jesus turned to the 12 and he says, are you also going to leave? And Peter says, Lord, where else shall we go? You alone have words of eternal life. And then Jesus said, have I not chosen you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? Now, it doesn't mean the one who is a devil was chosen. It simply means that our Lord had chosen them to be his apostles. But 11 of them he had chosen to grant this grace of the new birth, to move them from flesh to spirit, from darkness to light. But God, rich in mercy when we were dead, made us alive. So then what does it mean that God foreknew us and that he chose us according to foreknowledge if it doesn't mean he looked ahead and saw what we would do and made his choice of us based upon whether or not we would choose him? If we actually were dead in sin, we couldn't choose him. How could he actually look ahead and see faith apart from any intervention on his part? What does it mean that he foreknew us? What does it mean that he chose us according to foreknowledge. Well, it means that he foreloved us. That idea of knowing someone in Scripture and foreknowing somebody is not always referred to just knowing something about them. Now, those of you who read the King James might remember in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it starts off with the words, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore a son. Now, does that mean that Adam knew something about his wife, that Adam uh, came to learn something new about his wife, and that somehow brought about the, this child? No, obviously not. It means that, that he knew her in an intimate way. He loved his wife, and through that relationship, the Lord brought forth a child. The, the word know in Scripture does not always refer to just knowing something. It refers to a, a love or an intimacy. And what this is telling us is that God foreloved us. He chose us according to that love that he had for us before we were even created. That's exactly what he tells us in our text as we go back to Ephesians chapter 1. In love he predestined us. That's the same thing as this foreknowledge, this foreloving. He loved us and he predestined us. God loved his people before they even existed. Before the foundation of the world, he chose them and predestined them to become like his son. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are 
so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, if, if salvation were in the reach of, of everyone, why is it that not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise chose the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it's because God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the things that are strong. God wanted to show his wisdom, his grace, and his mercy so that no one would boast. God made certain choices in order to magnify his grace. But don't miss this one verse, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. It wasn't that... He just provided him, you saw, he foresaw, you chose. That's you and him. It's by his doing, you see, that you are in Christ Jesus for the reasons we've already seen. It has to be that way. Not only is the scripture very explicit, but it was impossible that we could have done it apart from his intervention. We did not want him. Now, again... Um, we need to ask the question, why bother with this whole fuss? I mean, it is what it is, right? Why make an issue out of it? Why even bring it out? Well, obviously, we, we, we have to do uh, this because this is what God reveals to us. And if God reveals something to us, we, we have to accept it. If he's revealed it to us, he wants us to know it. And so we need to understand it, and we need to accept it for one thing. But there's another couple of things, very important, that are at stake here. First of all, the first one is this, that if God had not intervened in the way that we're talking about here, if he had not made a choice and in time actually changed the direction of at least some of humanity, then every single human being on earth would have perished in their sins. You know, the position that we're referring to here, which is historically called Calvinism, we tend not to use terms like that because... It leads other, some people to believe we just sort of follow a person named Calvin, but that isn't true. Calvin was only one of many people who believed that this is what the Bible teaches. He just happened to become the most popular person who believed it, and so people have been named after that. But this position has been caricatured. To, to say something like this, that um, God is, is, as it were, reaching out, and he's, he's latching on to people who are trying to you know, who don't want anything to do with him and are running away from the, you know, the kingdom of heaven. He's dragging them in against their will. Now, actually, in a certain sense, he's doing that, but not really. But he's also, and this is the, this is the harder part, there's people trying to get in, but he's putting up this big barrier saying, no, you can't come in because I haven't chosen you. He's stopping people from being saved, and he's dragging people into the kingdom against his will. Well, I suppose if, if that's the way it was, we might all have an objection, but that's not the way it is. The Bible tells us, as a matter of fact, everybody is trying to get away. Everybody is running from God. Everybody hates God as they come into this world apart from his grace. None of us would have come to the light because we love the darkness. We were all enemies of God. We all hated him, and none of us wanted into the kingdom of heaven. So in a certain sense, yes, we all were running away. That's why I said that's partially true. Now, we didn't want to go to hell, that's for sure. But we really didn't want to go to heaven because God is there, because Jesus is there, because they're holy. And no one who is born in darkness loves the light. They don't want to go there because the light is there. Now, you need to notice that um, in that condition, the whole human race would have perished. They would have all rushed like that herd of swine when the Lord cast the demons out of the legion, the man who had the legion, into the swine. They all rushed down the banks of the, of the cliff and perished, as it were, in the, in the water. That's what all of mankind would have done if the Lord had not intervened. We all hated him. We were all running away from him. We all would have perished in hell forever. But the point is God had mercy on us. If you're a believer here this evening, he shows you. He brought the gospel to you. He converted you. He turned you around from the direction you were going and to get you to go the right direction. He, he changed your hearts. He opened your eyes. 
by his Holy Spirit, caused you to be born again. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive. So that being born again of the Spirit, we could see the kingdom of heaven. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ and offered in him. And we could receive the Lord Jesus Christ and enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's the difference that it makes. You see, if you're a believer, this is what he has done for you. If God had not chosen you, if election was not true, well, if it hadn't taken place, you would have perished in your sins. So that's one of the so what's. It does make a big difference. I mean, in actuality, election makes a huge difference. But second, since he alone is the reason why you chose to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, if you're a believer, you did believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you have to trust him in order to be saved. You need to remember to give credit to whom credit is due. You did this because of what he did. And so you have to give him that honor and that credit. You see, because he did it all. And really, scripturally, you didn't do anything. I mean, you didn't see your need. You, you hated the Lord and were trying to run away from him. I mean, you loved your sin. You weren't convicted of your sins apart from him. You loved them and indulged in them. You see, you, you wouldn't even have seen your need apart from him. You didn't choose the Lord because you happened to be smarter than the rest of the people in the world and you saw your need of Jesus Christ while the rest of them are, are dumb because they, they, you know, they've heard these things, but they don't see their need. I mean, the Bible says that you didn't even believe on the Lord Jesus Christ on your own because you were dead. God gave you everything. He did it all. Even the faith that you have to believe is a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Again, Ephesians is so full of the sovereignty of God. It says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Salvation is by grace. Paul tells us elsewhere that it has to be by faith in order that it might be grace or by grace. You see, faith, and, and this is something we're going to have to understand a little bit more about what faith is. In order for salvation to come to us entirely by God's grace, which means entirely by his unmerited favor, is a pure gift of his kindness and mercy. It has to be by faith. Otherwise, works get into the mix there. And if there is some work that we do, something we do to bring salvation to ourselves, we can at least boast in that one thing. But the Lord has made salvation in such a way that no one can boast. We already saw that in 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, that no man may boast before the Lord. Now, so many Christians have defined faith. Again, it's something that everybody can exercise at any time, but as something that we have to do in order to be saved. I mean, for instance, they, they look at this passage in Romans 4, verse 3. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And what they say is that Abraham had faith, and when he exercised that faith, God looked at that faith, and he says, Abraham, you are a righteous man because that faith you have, I am crediting to you as righteousness. Whoa. They actually believe that, and I've heard it said numerous times. But do you realize that, that if God saves us on the basis of faith, defined in that way that we are saved by our works, and we are not saved by the grace of Christ, all we need is Faith, and God will look at that faith and credit it to us as righteousness. But that's not what Paul means when he says that. Abraham believed God, and God credited to him not the righteousness of his act, but rather the righteousness of Jesus Christ, because that's the only way anyone can be saved. He became righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord even gave, according to what we've just seen, Abraham, the faith that he exercised, that he used, as it were, to believe. He made Abraham alive. And once Abraham was alive, 
He immediately trusted in the Lord because that is what spiritual life brings by its nature. You know, this is, again, something that we need to understand more clearly from Scripture. Again, where we come into the world spiritually dead, we want nothing to do with God, we can't exercise faith. Not the way the Bible describes it. We might be able to believe certain things, certain things are true, but we cannot trust in Jesus Christ and be saved apart from God's grace. When he makes us spiritually alive, he changes our nature so that we incline now towards God. We love God where we used to hate him. And now the Jesus that we see offered to us is something we, our heart just immediately goes out to and we trust him because it's our nature now to trust him. We look away from self, look, look away from our own works, and we look to Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. That's the furthest thing away from works. It's not a work we do that God looks at and says, you're just on the basis of your faith. Faith is something that looks to Jesus Christ and receives his righteousness as a free gift, and then God looks at us in the righteousness of Christ, and he says, you are just, you are righteous. But it's because of Christ's righteousness, not because of yours. When God makes you alive, that is what you do. You look to Jesus and you receive his righteousness as a free gift. That means that it's purely by grace. It is from first to last God's work. And so he deserves all the glory. And so we ask the question again, what difference does election make whether we believe it or not? Well, first of all, if there were no election, we'd all die. So it makes a big difference right there. But secondly, it strips you and me of every single reason we have to boast. We can't even boast in our faith and say, I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and I was saved. No, God gave me the grace to believe in Jesus and by his righteousness alone I'm saved. It has nothing to do with me and has everything to do with him. It gives all the glory to God. By the way, for those of you who were um, involved in that study we did in the hymn writers, uh, remember Augustus Toplady, uh, we're going to sing one of his hymns when we close. Augustus Toplady was criticized historically for writing, it seemed like, nasty letters uh, against uh, John Wesley. And we asked the question, well, why was he so upset with John Wesley? Why did he write the things that he did? It's because he looked at Wesley and he looked at his doctrine. God gives us all this grace and we choose if we want to choose or we don't choose if we don't want to choose. And, and he saw Wesley giving some of the credit, some of the glory of salvation to man rather than all of it to God. And he says, you are robbing God of his glory. This doctrine is wrong. You need to change it. And Wesley wouldn't change it because he was convinced that he was right. So that's why Augustus Toplady was angry. It's because... Wesley was, even though Wesley didn't think he was doing this, Wesley was robbing God of some of his glory. And he was giving it to man when God is worthy of all glory. So that is perhaps the most important thing as far as the difference of what we believe. If we don't believe that God is sovereign in salvation, to some degree we are robbing God of his glory because the Bible says from first to last, it is his work. He has done it in such a way that no one may boast of anything. God gets all the glory. So that's the difference. Yeah, that's, that's the rub, as it were. Now, I do want to ask one more question this evening, which I'm sure has occurred to some of you, with regard to this doctrine of election. And we'll close with this. If you're not a believer, does this doctrine mean that if God hasn't chosen you, that you're not going to be able to believe and be saved? Well, ultimately, there's only one inescapable conclusion. The answer, of course, is yes, you will perish if God hasn't chosen you. But you've got to realize that if that is the case, you would never care because you would still hate God and want nothing to do with him. You would never come to him unless he has chosen you. The, the bigger question is, what about those people who want to come to Jesus? And they think that the doctrine of election is somehow keeping them from coming, that God's not going to receive me because he hasn't chosen me. Does, does the doctrine of election mean that if you want to come to Jesus Christ, that you can't come to Jesus Christ? No. As a matter of fact, 
God actually commands you to come. And you are not to concern yourself with whether or not your name is written in that book because that's a book you're not going to be able to look at. The only thing you need to be concerned about is the fact that God commands you to come and he even says if you come, he will receive you. There's a quote on the back of your bulletin that I thought was, uh, was very good and I'll draw your attention to it. The one by David Clarkson. He uses the analogy of a person who's sick Will he take that medicine only if he knows it's going to cure him? He says this, when you are dangerously sick and the physician tells you, unless you take such a course of medicine, your case is desperate. Do you reason thus or in this way? If I knew that God had decreed my recovery, I would take that course of medicine that is so like to restore me. But until I know that God has decreed my recovery, I'll take nothing. Surely we should think such a reasoner not only sick, but distracted, perhaps crazy in a certain sense. Even so are the arms of Christ always open to receive a perishing sinner fleeing to him for refuge. And will you destroy yourself by suffering or allowing Satan to entangle you with a needless, impertinent, and unreasonable scruple? If there is no way but one, then run into it without delay never perplexing yourself with the decrees and secrets of God. In other words, don't let election hold you back. That's not something you can really know until you actually trust in Jesus Christ. If you want him, if you see your need for him, then he offers himself to you as a savior. He says to you, come. You know, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All you have to do is come to Christ. He says in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Notice the Father gives, they will come, and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. So if you want Jesus this evening and you don't know Jesus, if you want salvation that only he can give, all you need to do is come. The Bible says, turn from your sins, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will save you. But remember this, that if you do, and the Lord saves you, it's only because he first had mercy on you. Make sure you remember to give him all the glory for your salvation, because he is the one who has done it all. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And again, let's ask the Lord in his grace to uh, help us to apply what we've heard. Again, only the, well, only the Spirit of God truly knows what your needs are, what my needs are, and so forth, and what we need to take away from this particular sermon, what we've seen from the Word of God. But let's pray now that the Lord would show us and help us to apply it. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.